All right. Hey, uh, some of you, I, I met a number of you and you're freshmen. Uh, so you're basically away from home for the first time, right? So you're kind of finding your way with uh, this being different, making some of your own decisions. And thinking about that <clears throat> got me to thinking about the family that I grew up in and what was unique about it. I grew up in a family that uh, can only be described as highly analytical. My dad was an engineer. My mom was a stay-at-home mom, but she was really analytical, even more so than my dad. By analytical, uh, what do I mean by analytical? Somebody. Oh, we got an adult answering already, for heaven's sake. Let's have a student. Analytical. What do I mean by that? You know that word? Come on, you're a college freshman. Exactly. Questioning, critiquing everything. Everything has to make sense. So that, 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 that's the type of environment I grew up in. And my dad was an engineer and he loved projects. So I got to thinking about this and uh, the kind of environment I was brought up in. Uh, every Saturday morning my dad had a project, something that he wanted to accomplish around the house. And I was required to be his assistant on that project till 12 noon, at which point I was freed up to do whatever it is I wanted to do for the rest of the day. And uh, I am uh, exceedingly mechanically disinclined. That means I can't fix anything. And my dad would not accept that. He felt that, you know, if you're ever going to be a functional adult, you're kind of a semi-functional adult, Don, I would say, uh, you had to be able to fix things. Well, I never quite got that. One of the projects that he worked on now, we're back in the 60s now, and I was thinking about this. You people were born in the 90s, right? Okay, so. The, you have to Google what cars looked like back then, okay? We had, in fact, this is a brand that doesn't even exist anymore. Pontiac, anybody hear the brand Pontiac? It's a, it was a GM brand, but they wiped it out because it was no good, that kind of thing. Oldsmobile, same thing. Anyway, my dad liked new cars, so we had a 63 Pontiac station wagon, a 66 Pontiac station wagon, and a 69 Pontiac station wagon. Each one of these large vehicles got larger. My dad wanted the car to be in the garage. When we got the 63 Pontiac, it would not fit in the garage because it was so large. So my dad would not accept that. He decides he's going to build, uh, not exactly in addition to the garage, but he kicked out half of the back of the garage, like a skirt roof type thing. Am I making sense here? So your garage is up here, just enough to drive the nose of the car underneath there. So he does this five-week construction project so that the car will fit in the garage so that you can drive it underneath. So you had to drive it in exactly like this. Then we get the 69 station wagon. What do you think was the case? What's that? Bigger. Bigger. Wouldn't fit. But they came, the, the, the bumpers came to a point. You probably can't even imagine this cars, that cars were this ugly. But it came to a point. And he measured the thing, and he found that it was only about six inches longer than the other car, and all of the six inches was in the point. So what he did was he decided he could still fit the car into the garage if he would cut out a sheet metal box about the size of a shoe box, and if you pulled the car straight on in like this, you could get the point of the car into the box and close the garage door. Now, who else would do that? It was like, who else even thinks of that? That's the kind of house I grew up in. Everything was analytical. Everything had to be a certain way. Everything had to make sense. And if something didn't make sense, for instance, my mother. My mother was a stay-at-home mom. And whenever there was a car parked on the street that she didn't recognize, what do you think happened? Do you people talk, or what, 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 what's going on here? <laughs> what do you think happened? When there's a car on the street that she assumed it was a stranger she, and it was suspicious. She assumed it was a stranger and it was suspicious. And then what happened with her suspicion? She didn't go that far, but she could have. That's a yeah, that 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 uh, small town, everything was was pretty copacetic there, but she got real curious, so she would get distracted from making coleslaw. You know, she'd be in the kitchen. Does everybody know what coleslaw is? I don't really think it should exist anymore, but it does. Uh, <laughs> Cabbage and mayonnaise. Anyway, uh, she would get distracted and she would go, uh, keep going to the front and try to figure out whose car this was. And I didn't understand this. Why do you care? You know, it's a public street, you know. 
So this is the kind of, of, of upbringing I got. So I went away to college, same situation you're in now, I'm 18, and I couldn't understand that where people would just do things spontaneously. You, got, you do things spontaneously every once in a while? You look like a pretty spontaneous guy. Yeah. Are you a spontaneous guy? All the time? Yeah. I couldn't understand that. I thought, you know, anything you were going to do, you had to talk about beforehand and work it out and make sure it made sense because that was the way I was raised. So the first exposure I had to anything that wasn't completely thought out, talked out, processed out was when I went to college. That was a different culture for me. So having a conversation with a friend of mine the other day, I have lunch with him maybe, maybe once a year, catch it up a little bit. And I was asking about his wife. His wife is a reading specialist in the public school system. So she's, you know, specialist in reading. Uh, I asked him how she was doing, how's Alicia doing, how she like her job. He said, well, she likes it a lot better this year. And so me being the bright, inquisitive person I am, I said, what makes this year different than other years? She said, oh, she's in a different school. I said, oh, she changed jobs? He said, no, she's in the same school district. This is her third different school. And I said, well, what's the difference? He said, he said every school has been a completely different experience for her. Completely different feel, loves her job now, did not like her job before. What's up with that? All in the same school district. My firm, North Group Consultants, uh, I'll click ahead here. No, oh, there we go. Is primarily engaged in helping our clients uh, with organizational health and performance, and we also help organizations through times of transition, usually leadership transitions of some kind between generations. Uh, I had uh, thought about telling this uh, story before I got here. I did not know that one of the executives of the company that I was going to tell the story about was going to show up. Mr. Banzoff is here to make sure that I'm accurate with my story, but about uh, five years ago, uh, my firm was approached by Don's firm about helping with them with some planning. We do some strategic planning type work and so, so, so we did that and, and uh, had some success with it. At the end of the process we started talking about, well, should, there's just some other things that we should be doing here together. And so they allowed my firm to come in and do what we normally do when we're first engaged with a new client and that is we do an organizational health and performance assessment. That's a fancy way of saying that we go in and we interview a, a, a large cross-section of people in the organization. And what we're trying to understand in the organization is we're trying to understand how the everyday rituals and practices and behaviors in that organization support the desired outcomes and mission of that organization. Does that make sense? So we're trying to figure out what the culture of the organization is. Why are we trying to figure that out? Well, because that organization has certain things that they want to accomplish. And certain things that happen there every day support that. And inevitably, in almost any organization, certain things that happen every day do not support that. So basically, we want to do more of the stuff that supports us in moving toward that and less of the stuff that doesn't. But there's always some stuff that doesn't that we've got to stop. At the time, the organization had a strategy. And if you, this was six years ago, or five years ago, excuse me. If you subtract five years, we're in the fall of 2009. Any of you know anything about American economics? What was happening in the fall of 2009? Economically, United States. Tell me your name. Leah. Leah, thank you. It wasn't very good because of the housing crisis. Right, uh, uh, thank you. It, uh, it's being dubbed the Great Recession, something short of the Great Dis Depression, which is in the 30s, which you'll learn about in economics class. But it was really the second uh, most difficult economic times for the American economy uh, in the last hundred years. Okay, so it's called the Great Recession. Here in, locally, in Lancaster County, I mean Lancaster County, uh, 2009 was the pit of the Depression. Started, started nationally in 2007, but it really hit here in 2009. The organization that we were working with had a strategy to get through that recession. And the strategy worked. And the strategy was largely put in place because they wanted to make sure that they had enough work to maintain their very best people until they had time 
to put in place something that wasn't as temporary as the strategy that they worked through. Am I making sense here? Okay? We took that opportunity to focus on how to build a culture, a way of doing things in that company that would eventually get us beyond strategy. Am I right here, Don? Am I still doing okay? That would get us to a point where we could thrive in any economy with any strategy that we chose. Because the executives of that company decided to buy into my philosophy, which they probably already understood, which is culture eats strategy for lunch. There is nothing more important in a business organization than the culture. I want to go back in my history. I was talking uh, with, a, with a client of mine earlier this morning. We were talking a little bit about different places that we had, had worked in our, uh, in our personal history. And I was reflecting back to the one year in my entire 34-year career that I worked for a large corporation. 33 of my years in business, I've worked for small businesses and you know, relatively small companies, including a very small company that I own and operate now. But I worked for a, nationally, uh, a national company that was publicly traded for one year. I was shocked the first day I went there uh, because there were 275 people in one room. So you could see, it was a very, obviously a very large room, you could see all 275 people. My seat, I was hired to be a supervisor of a, it was an insurance company, I was hired to be a supervisor of a unit. All the people that reported to me sat in front of me. I sat behind them and the desks were exactly lined up like me to the back of the room here. What do you think the belief was in that company about what a supervisor should do? What do you, what do you think they believed? Yeah, exactly, that your job was to watch over people, which in turn gave you the idea that you were suspicious of the motivations of the employees as to whether any chance they got they were actually going to work, uh, goof off and do something other than what they had signed on to do. That was, that was the idea, I think. Of course, it was never stated because it would sound too negative to state that, but when you go into a room and everybody's lined up this way and the supervisor's at the back, and by the way, my manager was behind me, it was a pretty, uh, pretty good uh, idea of what the belief system of that organization was about employees. On top of that, there was a gentleman. He was the vice president in charge of all this 275 people. And uh, we had a meeting uh, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And the meeting was called Production and Control. Just think about that word for a minute. And in that meeting, all the statistics that applied to the way that that whole room operated were put up on a, on a whiteboard for everybody to see. So the statistics that applied to my area of responsibility, all the other areas of responsibility, they're all up, up on the wall to see. Am I making sense here? And you could never tell which number the vice president was going to pick out and go right in on somebody and say, why is that number off? And he would stay on that person until they were reduced to almost not being able to speak. Am I with you? You understand? What do you think we felt when we went into that meeting? What, what was my emotion? Dread. Yeah, dread. That's an even better word than the one I was thinking of. Every day you went in, now it did do one thing, I was always ready for that meeting, but I didn't know what he was going to ask. Uh, so it did use dread or fear as somewhat of a motivator to be prepared for that meeting. But I saw a number of people over the short nine months that I chose to work there uh, leave that meeting uh, literally in tears. Male, female, didn't matter. Left that meeting in tears because they had been reduced, uh, you know, to being told that they didn't know what they were doing in front of a whole group of colleagues. But what would happen later, and I don't know how many other people noticed this, I'm an observer of human behavior, so I watched this, is that same Vice President, at some point in that morning, you could almost bet your paycheck that he would go to the person that he had destroyed earlier in the day and he would ask them to take a walk with him. And he would walk around 
the entire circumference of the room with his arm around them. A very bizarre method of leadership. So it was this idea that, uh, at least I read it as an idea, that he could control you if he got a hold of your emotions. Am I making sense? So of course, you were okay when you were being walked around the room because Ron had his arm around you. And 80% of the people that were observing this, or might have been observing this, weren't in the room to know what had happened to you two hours ago. So it was a very different kind of method uh, of control. All of what I'm talking about, I'm talking about because they are experiences that I've had uh, that tell me something about culture. And of course, the title of my address today is Culture Eat Strategy, Strategy for Lunch. I got that statement from one of my colleagues who's been saying it for years, helping it to convince our firm that this is in fact true, which we now believe, that culture is more important than anything else in the operation of a business organization. And when I was getting ready for the meeting, somebody said to me, I don't think Joanne, that's my colleague, was the first person to say that. They think Peter Drucker was the first person to say that. Well, Peter Drucker is regarded as the, the father of uh, modern day management theory. Is that fair to say that, Dr. Williams? Yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll be exposed to his teachings and his theory over time. But at any rate, wherever it emanated, uh, what we're saying about it is that we think culture uh, is the most important thing in determining the outcomes and mission accomplishment of a, of a business organization. So let's talk about what is culture. I've got a few different definitions for you. The set of shared attitudes, values, goals, and practices that characterize an organization or institution. Always want to go to the most authoritative source for our definitions there. The unique personality of an organization or institution. Uh, even this campus, Elizabethtown, has some kind of uniqueness to it. It has some kind of unique personality. And in some ways, for most of you, that personality uh, of, of this organization must have felt okay to you, or you wouldn't be here. Some of you may be here because your parents came here, because it's close by, or because you got a specific scholarship. Others of you, I suspect, visited, how many places did you visit before you decided on here? Three, four, five, more? Six even? Okay, yeah. Do you remember how many places you visited before you came here? Yeah. A lot? Ten. Ten. Wow. You're very indecisive. Okay. <laughs> um, ultimately, I think that you choose a place because of how it feels. How many of you think you chose E-Town because of how it felt? There's a lot of other things that kind of come out even, aren't there? The course load, you know, the degree that you get, the buildings on campus, the food, all those other things, they kind of come out even after a while. There's even ways for costs of organizations to come out even. I think most of you are here because of the feel. I have a daughter that's a freshman in college, and um, the day she goes to college in Boston, Massachusetts, probably the only Boston there is, uh, the day we visited there, uh, there was two feet of snow, it was windy, and it was 18 degrees, and our family just hates cold weather. And when we got on the campus, I thought, there is no way she will go to this college. She'll, she'll feel this cold weather, she'll look around, she'll think it's that way 12 months a year, and it'll be off the list. But that wasn't the case at all. There was something else there, and I asked her later, I said, what was it? She said, when we took the tour of the campus, there was a... Uh, a student, she was a freshman at the time in her second semester, this was February, my daughter's junior year in high school, and she said, I really liked her. And when she went around campus, everybody she saw, she called by name. And that's what attracted my daughter to that college. Just something that simple. You know, we could have gone into all analytical stuff, she's an elementary education major, comparing this to other schools, comparing costs, uh, comparing distances, all this kind of thing. But something small like that, the feel of it, the unique personality of that organization attracted it. Another definition of what is culture, I asked some of my colleagues to give me their own definition of culture, is to just, just to recognize it's the pattern of organizational life. It's just the pattern of the way things happen. There's certain things that are acceptable and certain things that are not acceptable. 
somewhere along the line here, uh, Dr. Williams asked you to uh, dress decently on Fridays, right? Yeah. Didn't wear a tie yourself, <laughs> but you're still looking good. Uh, so my, now, Zach did not get the memo. Zach, you knew I was coming here, right? You did not get the memo, right? Okay, so you get credit for being here, but it's crossed off by the fact that you uh, dress so exceedingly poorly today. But at any rate, uh, that completely threw me off. What was my next point? <laughs> There's a pattern in this room today that says what's acceptable and what's not. Now, Zach's not going to pay a big price for, for not getting the memo today, but most of you fit in with what the expectations were here today. And it's very hard to go to an organization and swim against the tide, isn't it? There are certain things that the first few weeks you're here, you kind of understood about what happens at E-Town. And in some way, shape, or form, you probably decided, most of you, to conform to those things. Because mostly, we don't like to stand out. Mostly, we don't like to be exposed. One of my colleagues, when I asked him to talk about culture, uh, described it to me as something like uh, the current in a river. It's pretty easy to swim with the current. If any of you are swimmers, uh, uh, the ocean coming in or the current in a river, it's pretty easy to swim with it. In fact, it can be fairly relaxing. You fit in, you're floating along, and you're getting somewhere. That's the way culture is. When you come in and you already fit with the standard practices, the observed practices of the organization, things go along fine. When you start to swim upstream, it gets a little harder. Does that make sense? One of my colleagues just simply likes to describe culture as the way we do things around here. Every organization has a way that they do things around here. In fact, I was thinking uh, there'll even be uh, a culture an expectation, a way of doing things in this room when I get here this morning. And I don't know what it's going to be. I had some information from Dr. Williams and from Cindy Sterling that there'd be about 100 business students here. There might be some folks from the outside. Didn't know exactly what the room was going to look like. We had some correspondence about that. But I didn't actually know what the culture was going to be like. I, in fact, I thought if I asked you people a few questions, you'd actually answer them. I have now abandoned that thought because you just sit there and stare at me when I ask really easy questions. So you're supposed to laugh at that, too. So, not getting much here, am I? So part of my job is to see if I can influence you to the type of response that I'd like to have here today, which that ain't gone so well. well kind of hoping I get some more response than what I'm getting. It's mostly people over 40 that are laughing at my stuff. So, uh, so you might have come here today and said, OK, I've got to be here. Uh, there's going to be some lame, egotistical guy standing up front talking about how great his business is. All right? And so if that's what you thought coming in, I would hope that you think something slightly different than that when you leave. But that's part of the culture that would be in the room, because if you came in today and you thought there's going to be some lame, egotistical guy talking about how great his business is and doing it in as uh, dry a manner as possible, and I'm going to catch up by you know, reading some tweets, sending out some tweets about how lame this guy is, that kind of thing, that's what I'm going to do today. Uh, I don't know uh, that you might have come in with that thought. In fact, some of you are probably have up that thought to think I'm even more lame than what you thought I would be today. But my point is, is that there's some kind of, of, of feeling about even being here, being in, in, in Dr. Williams's classroom, being in your dorm, being part of a social group, that it's much easier to be a part of than to try and change. Does that make sense to you? OK, so these are some definitions of culture. Uh, you know, I'm coming to talk to a group of college students, and I'm talking about a, a culture, and I'm asserting that culture eats strategy for lunch, by which I mean that culture is the most important thing uh, that dictates successes or lack thereof in business organizations. And so I ask myself, if I'm a student now at Elizabethtown College, I'm 18, I'm 19, I'm 20 years old, why should I care? Well, I think you should care because every organization, institution, or group of people has a culture. There's no getting away from it. Your family has it, and for some of you, this is the first time away from your family, and you're starting to experience some things that are different than the way your family did things. I'll give you an example. 
I mentioned my 18-year-old daughter moved into a college dorm room two weeks ago. And we are a family that when there is something to do, we do it right away. That's just, my, my wife and I are that way. You come home from vacation, we immediately unpack the car, we put our clothes back in the drawer, we put everything back where it belongs, nothing gets in the way of that, look out, that's what we're going to do. It's all done in 15 or 20 minutes and our kids are pretty much do things the same way because that's the culture in our household. We get things done right away. So, my daughter's roommate had an 8.30 move-in time and she had a 10.30 move-in time. So when we got there, we naturally thought what about our, our daughter's roommate? She'd be done. She'd be done, exactly right. Do you think she was? Not even close. Okay. So we come in at 10.30 and we, we bring all our stuff in and we just, we just go into gear. You know, I say to my daughter, where do you want things? Let's get, them, let's get them hooked up. Let's hook up the TV. Let's hook up the computer. Let's jack up the bed. Let's put the, you know, get the room the way you want. Let's unpack your clothes. Let's get them where it's... So we've got all this done by noon. Now, our youngest daughter, who I'm talking about here, is the least skilled at this whole thing. Okay, she, you know, she, she, she wasn't as good at this do it right now sort of philosophy as the rest of us, but when she got to college, all of a sudden she wanted to do it right now. So we uh, FaceTimed with her. That's kind of cool. I guess that's, that's where you can look through a phone and see somebody's face. It's a very unique kind of thing. You people are used to that, right? You FaceTime with your boyfriend? Yeah. Do you? <laughs> I thought so. You look like a FaceTimer. All right. Uh, <laughs> So we FaceTime with her a couple nights later, and obviously the, 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 the roommate is not in the room. She says, Dad, she said, Autumn's a roommate's name. She says, Autumn, she, she hasn't unpacked her stuff yet. It's still lying on the floor. It's driving me nuts. Now, I'm thinking of the condition of her room for the last 18 years. I'm like, how can that be driving you nuts? But at any rate, the point is that this was her first experience with living with somebody that didn't take care of her stuff right away. and It was driving her nuts. This is just different than what she was used to. Every organization, institution, group of people, or even dorm room, in that case, has a culture. Of course, cultures are based on human behavioral patterns. We all have patterns, right? We all have patterns of the way we do things. Some we're conscious about, some we're not conscious about. We just go ahead and do them. You know, I like to use, you know, brushing your teeth with your dominant hand as an example. If you've ever broken your hand or have to do it with the other hand, you know, it's difficult. So it's difficult to break those patterns. Most of those patterns we don't think about. But the patterns we have in life generally govern the success that we have in life toward our desired goals because it's just the way we operate every day without thinking. Cultures are also based on strongly held beliefs, beliefs that have been part of our belief system since we were young or that we converted to somewhere along the line. When I'm talking to beliefs, I'm not necessarily talking about spiritual beliefs, although I could be, but beliefs about how things should work, beliefs about what's right and wrong, beliefs about how other people should behave that may be violated when other people behave in ways that are different than what we think. So all of these things play into culture. Why should I care? You are affected in some way by the culture of every group of which you are a part. Most of us want to conform. We are by nature conformists, meaning that when we go into a, a new situation, we want to conform to what's there. Why? Why would we want to conform? To fit, in. to fit in, exactly right, because we want to feel accepted. Acceptance is a very high need of all human beings. Would you agree with that? And sometimes you end up doing things that you probably, I don't know, shouldn't do. Probably some of those choices are facing you right now as a college freshman. Should I go to that party? Should I be with that group of people? Should I date that guy or gal? Uh, whatever that is. Part of what's working at you is you want to fit in. You want to fit in with the standard practices, the accepted practices uh, that you see around you and whatever social group you're a part of. And I like to say this, culture is a paradox. You know what the word paradox means? You probably should if you're a college freshman, my word. You don't know what it means, do you, Evan? I'm not going to ask you uh, because I don't want to put you on the spot. But culture is a paradox. A paradox is, uh, is two things that appear to be in opposition to each other but actually work together. That's what a paradox is, okay? Culture is a paradox. It shapes you and you shape culture. So every group that you're a part of, you are in some way shaped by. And if you are influential at all, and most of you are in some way, shape, or form, you shape it a little bit. So this is, this is happening at the same time, okay? Why should you care? There's four reasons. Why should you care in the future? Well, I think you should care in the future because Dr. Williams told me that he, he and his colleagues are training you to be business leaders in the future. And if you're going to be business leaders in the future, you're going to need to understand the nature of culture and the organizations that you're invited into, and you're going to need to decide 
how you're going to work with the cultures that you become a part of. Why should you care in the future? Because we believe that culture, not strategy, culture is the greatest determinant of organizational success. How many of you own an Apple product? Just about everybody. You know, an iPad, an iPad mini, an iPod, iPhone. How many of you are, what's the new one that's coming out? iPhone 6, am I right on that? How many of you are just lusting after that phone? Yeah. Yeah, I don't, okay. Apple's a very interesting organization. And undoubtedly, they have a strategy. In fact, they have a series of strategies. I don't doubt that. But I don't have to go to Apple headquarters to know that the most powerful thing at Apple is their culture. And knowing what you know about Apple's culture, what would you say is part of their culture? What's part of their standard practices? What, what do you think? Just think about the products they put out. Yes, innovation and open ideas. And let me tell you, wouldn't you think that would be part of every organization? Wouldn't you think every organization would want to uh, be open to new ideas and, and new stuff that might lead us to new products and new services? Wouldn't you think every organization would want to be open to innovation, new ideas, new, new ways of doing things? Wouldn't you think that? It's not the case. It is very likely that you will have an employer in the next 10 years that will tell you that they are, but they will not be. And why would an organization not be open to your new ideas? What's the reason? Yeah, yeah, they might think that, 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 that what they're already doing is just going to keep on working. In some cases, maybe they have some, you know, some history with that. Why else? People are afraid of change. People are, you think? People are afraid of change. Yeah, yeah. Uh, why else? Why else wouldn't people be open to new ideas, innovations, beliefs, those sorts of things? Might be a risk and not pay off. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm convinced that it's not Apple's strategy, but it's Apple's culture that makes them so successful. And their culture includes whatever they've already made is not good enough. Does that make sense? You saw the wristwatch you're coming out with? Probably all saw that, right? Pretty cool. You know, basically a computer on your wrist. Okay. You know, theirs is probably going to be, I don't know, it's not actually a market leader. I think Samsung has one before them. Am I right about that? Okay. But some of you are going to say, when you can afford to get one, I'm getting apples because apples cooler, right? Some way apples cooler. And I don't know how they got that, but somehow in their culture too or in their branding, they've cultivated that idea. And I can tell you right now, they don't care if Mike, Don, or I has an iPhone or an iPod. They want you. And they want you for life. And they want you because they're always going to be ahead of what you're thinking is next. And they're going to try to stay cool with you guys because that's their culture. So it's a powerful thing when you have an esteemed culture. In fact, culture eats strategy for lunch. There are many things that can and should happen from the bottom up in an organization. Changing culture is not one of them. I love when things happen from the bottom up in an organization. I love when employees get an idea and they play it through and we have an open organization that allows that to happen. That is just wonderful when that happens. But swimming upstream against the current is very difficult to do. And changing a culture, even a social organization. Here, some of you will join social organizations. You, do you have fraternities and sororities here? I didn't think so. But uh, you, you'll join an organization, and some of you will get into it and say, yeah, this is OK, but this really doesn't work right. You know, we could be better than this, uh, you know, whether it maybe you're on the hockey team or, 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 or in a business student's organization or you're in the Spanish club or whatever it is that you're, you're going to get into it, and something's not going to feel right to you. You know, you're going to say, this, we could be better, just sitting around, you know, staring at each other. We could be better than this. It's very difficult to change a culture. And as a result, when you start out doing one, you generally need some level of authority, responsibility, or respect in order to get that done. And usually that happens from the top of an organization. 
Changes or adjustment in organizational culture are the business of, in fact, should be the priority of leaders. When you think about your role in the future as an organizational leader, and I suspect many of you will get that privilege at some point in your life because you're getting an excellent education here at E-Town, it's going to bring many opportunities to you in the future. My belief is that the thing that you really want to understand is you want to understand patterns of human and organizational behavior because it's those patterns of human and organizational behavior that will produce success or block success in an organization. And the things you see that are producing success in the organization, you want to see more of, right? And the things that are blocking, you want to see less of and figure out how to eliminate them. Changes or adjustments in organizational culture are the business of, in fact, should be the priority of leaders. Why should I care in the future? Well, because in his original email to me, Dr. Williams said, we are training our students to be business leaders. So when I was reading back over the correspondence he and I had together over the last couple of months, I thought, you know what? These young people are going to be the business leaders of the future, and they're going to need to understand that culture is the greatest determinant of organizational success, Then, in fact, culture eats strategy for lunch. In order to understand culture, you need to do two things, in my belief, that uh, all good leaders do really well. And one is they observe, and the other is they listen. They observe the patterns of behavior in the organization. They drive for clarity and consistency in the organization. Human beings operate best under conditions of clarity and consistency. Does that make sense to you? When we take out all the variables and we say there's no blockages to you doing what you need to do today. I experienced this already today in that I had some remarks prepared that, that I'm sharing with you now. But when I got here, I wanted to know that my PowerPoint worked, that I had a clicker, that I did not have to do anything with my microphone, because all of those things are distractions to me over against uh, what I was asked to do here today, which was deliver a reasonably coherent lecture. Okay? And all those things were taken care of. When I got here, it was great, because I had clarity and consistency about what the conditions were going to be like and exactly what, uh, what Cindy, and Cindy Sterling and Dr. Williams told me would be the case was the case when I was got here, so I didn't have any additional anxiety. Human beings operate best under conditions of clarity and consistency and it's the leader's job to provide clarity and consistency. How should we go about changing a culture? If you get the opportunity to be a leader, and many of you will, uh, I hope you will apply your trade of observing human behavior and listening most of the time rather than talking most of the time. And you may get a chance to go about making adjustments or changes in a culture of a business or not-for-profit organization in the future. First of all, decide what will most benefit the mission and desired outcomes of the organization. Well, when I say decide, this isn't a singular effort. This isn't something that one person does. But together uh, with the organization, whatever group you're in, you need, to, you need to be clear about the mission of the organization. You're, you've already talked about mission in certain classes, I'm sure that you have, but the mission is just uh, the reason for being, why we are here. We need to be clear about that, and then we need to be clear about what the desired outcomes or the goals of the organization are. We need to decide that, and then we need to determine, this is through observation and listening largely, watching human behavior, watching how things fit together, watching what works and what doesn't work. We need to determine the beliefs and patterns of behavior that are beneficial to the mission and desired outcomes of the organization. When we recognize the ones that are beneficial, what do we want to do? We want to recognize, we want to reinforce, and we want to reward those behaviors. Pretty simple. But when we recognize people that are doing the things that they should be doing, they're operating under conditions of clarity and consistency, they're getting in in the morning and they're accomplishing their objectives that they've already agreed upon with you, we want to recognize, reinforce, and reward those behaviors. And of course, the flip side, is we need to determine the beliefs and patterns of behavior that are not beneficial. And in every organization, there's going to be some. There's always going to be some. There's always going to be some patterns of behavior that need to be corrected. And of course, those are ones that we want to recognize, redirect, and replace. And here's the hard part. The leaders of the organization must consistently model the desired beliefs and behaviors. I had the privilege of going into uh, an organization a number of years ago. Uh, it was an organization that did a lot, of, a lot of things really well. They had a really, really great product. You know, what people paid for uh, that that organization produced was stellar, top, top flight. 
And I also found when we got in and, and, and listened to people and observed their patterns of behavior that the people that were employed in the organization really bought into the mission of the organization. They really thought that the reason for being was on target. But what we also found is people did not enjoy their employment experience. And the reason they didn't employ their enjoyment ex enjoy their employment experience was pretty simple. They got very little affirmation. They got very little feedback about what they were doing well. And lots was asked of them. Why? Because the mission was so paramount that everything was driven to the mission. Does that make sense? To producing the product that they had, which was an excellent product. But sooner or later, people run out of gas. And they need their tank to be filled again. So we recognized this, and then I was asked to take on a role in the organization, and I spent almost all my time in that organization uh, being nice to people. Just simply being nice to people. And I knew that after a while, I wasn't there every day because I'm a consultant, I came in every couple days, that every time I came into the organization, I better have my A affirmation game on because that became what was expected of me. And that was also what I was demanding of the leaders of the organization. I said, your people have no gas left in the tank. They're working 70 hours a week. They're committed to this mission. They're giving up time with their families. They're not taking their vacation days. They're underpaid. We might be able to correct all of that if we refill their tank with affirmation and encouragement about real, genuine, good things that they're doing. And so I became the king of affirmation. Every small thing that I could find that was being done well in that organization and I can associate with a department or individual, I just simply went to them, recognized it, and thanked them for it. It was a pretty simple, inexpensive way to reinvigorate the organization. Those practices then shared with the other leaders of that organization have completely changed the culture of that organization. Now it's a culture where uh, we have a single driving uh, cultural imperative in that organization, and that's trust. The entire organization and its culture is built around the word trust, and it, it's broken down, but everybody understands what that means. But we had to get the trust first that we cared about people. Does that make sense to you? When people know that they're cared about, when they have clarity, when they have consistency, they're freed up to do their best work. And if on top of that, their strengths are paired up with things that they can act that they're uh, capable of doing in the organization. If they're matched up strength on expectation, they can really succeed and produce wonderful things. But remember, when you stand for something in an organization, you have to stand for it every day. And modeling this stuff can be hard work. Quite simply, modeling productive behaviors is hard work. Culture reads strategy for lunch. That's my belief that culture is the most important determinant of organizational success. I also believe that leadership, the types of things we're talking about here this morning, is extremely hard work and that culture is the primary work of organizational leadership. I have a final encouragement for you and then I'd be happy to take a few questions or comments that you have. Um, you've probably seen this before. I just came across it again earlier this week. Uh, I don't know who originally wrote it. The guy that reproduced it said it was just an ancient uh, saying. Watch your thoughts, they become words. Watch your words, they become actions. Watch your actions, they become habits. Watch your habits, they become your character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. The business world is looking for leaders of character to help them fulfill their destiny. You're being trained here at Elizabethtown College to uh, be the business leaders of the future and the successful business leaders of the future will be those who are intentional about shaping the cultures of their organizations in a way that achieves the desired outcomes and fulfills the mission of their organizations. Culture eats strategy for lunch. Thank you. We have a few minutes. I'd be happy to uh, respond to any questions or comments or even challenges that you might have. Sir. Could a business with a pretty poor, you know, like, uh, business plan mm -hmm. still somehow get by or thrive with a, a really impactful culture? Yeah, that's a really good question. The question was, could a business that had a poor business plan survive uh, if it had a very strong culture. 
Uh, I would say yes in the short term, but that a strong culture is incompatible in the mid to long run with a poor business plan. Because if you had the right kind of culture that was attached to uh, the fulfillment of your mission and desired outcomes, it would demand a successful business plan. Does that make sense? But I'd rather have a strong culture and a poor business plan to start out with than I would to have a great business plan and a culture that did not support it because the strategy sits inside of the culture. Am I making sense to you? And I'm not downing strategy here today. Hey, please, if you got that, I, I, miss, uh, I didn't deliver my full message if I did this. Organizations need strategy. They need to know how they're going to differentiate themselves in the marketplace, okay? But I believe that that sits inside a culture. Does that make sense? It sits inside the way that we behave every day and what we believe about each other and what our ritualistic practices are. Great question. Thank you. Somebody else. Yes. What if you were the guy on the, or girl on the bottom mm -hmm. who has new ideas? Mm -hmm. how, what would you suggest mm -hmm. that they go about how to change and bring innovation that could change a culture? Yeah, wow. Um, you know, I think a lot of that would depend on <laughs> the culture that already exists in the, the department or area that person is in. And I hate to be fatalistic here, but if the area that that person is in is not accepting to that type of input or change, it's going to be really difficult. And the only thing left you've got then is your character and how you carry yourself, which can be pretty powerful too. Am I making sense here? Okay. So if they're not accepting to some idea you have, you can at least uh, be the change you want to see in the world, if you will, to, 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 to quote Gandhi. You probably all, all heard that one before. That's probably all you have left. But it's a really difficult way to go because you're swimming upstream. Um, and so uh, I think that's a great question because, I don't know, a certain percentage of you are going, uh, you're so bright, what's your first name? Blair. Blair, thank you. Uh, a certain amount of you are going to experience in your first or second job what Blair what Blair referred to is you're going to have a very frustrating experience. I, I can almost guarantee you that a third to half, maybe three quarters, you're going to have a very frustrating experience in your first job because you'll learn stuff here that is not being carried out in that organization. It's, it's inevitable. And your character is going to be determined by how you, how you fight through that and how you model out what you think uh, the best individual your best individual practice, how you, how you model out what your convictions are. So I think that's probably the place to start. Thank you. Someone else? Sir. Very good program. Thank you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I don't know about governmental agencies. Uh, I could have a few sarcastic comments there, but I'll avoid them. Um, but I've never worked with any. But not-for-profits, yes, exactly. And I would make the case that uh, some of you, I hope, will work for not-for-profit organizations or have already or will get opportunities to intern with them. The only real difference, this is my belief, some of you may fight with me on this, between not-for-profit organizations and for-profit organizations is the tax code classification. Okay, it's a tax code classification. That's all it is. We still have to have a mission that we're driving toward, our reason for being. We still have to have a set of desired outcomes. We still have to put a culture in place that helps us to move toward that, the fulfillment of those, that mission and those desired outcomes. So absolutely yes. And uh, yeah, I can think of a couple right off the top of my head that just have great organizational leadership, strong culture that reinforces their mission. What about, say, a governmental area, mm. NASA Yeah. Yeah, boy. Yeah, I, I just, uh, again, I could make some sarcastic comments, but they wouldn't be good. Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, I would think so, you know. Uh, if we go back, you know, if you think back to NASA in the 60s with President Kennedy, this is, you know, I don't know if you've read about this in your history books, but President Kennedy declared that we would be the first people uh, to the moon, right? And we were, July 16th, 1969. Uh, so something... In, in, in that whole culture of National Aeronautic and Space Administration that you're referring to got us there. So there must have been something good in that. There was a competitive thing going on with the, the Russians at the time. So I would su suggest that there must have been something positive about that culture. Of course, we've read stuff about the IRS. The IRS is an easy target. You know, it's an easy target. I'm sure there's very fine people working for the IRS. Clearly there are. 
uh, but some of the targeting that we've seen or think we've seen over the last six months is uh, indication of some part of the culture that doesn't work. Jerry. As a consultant, you have been in the business for many years. You've gone to many organizations or been retained mm -hmm. by many organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess the easiest way to, to ask it is your success rate to get top mm. management, especially mm. family business, mm -hmm. that have been running the same way for years and yeah. years. Yeah. How do you get them? change and understand what you're trying to say. Yeah. And how many failures mm -hmm. did, you, did you have in your role? Oh, yeah. We've, we've had some. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we've had some. Some of them are still paying us for reasons I can't understand. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, the question of how, uh, we've always believed in our own organization that it's through sustained relationships. It's not through speeches like this. It's not through great strategies. It's by it's by being in relationship with people and understanding what's important to them, valuing what's important to them, and finding ways to support what's important to them, and then pointing out, well, if that's important to you, I'm seeing this pattern of behavior in a different part of the organization that doesn't match up with that, and I think there's kind of a trail that leads back to you. That's a hard conversation, but it's a pretty common conversation that we have because we very often get into organizations and we get this thing about, hey, I get no feedback. I don't know when I do well and when I don't, but I know when I don't more often than when I do, and I don't like that. You know, that's what the employees would tell us. So we would go back and, you know, say, hey, we're not doing well at that area, but you've got a guy, that, the leader, that when you sit down, he wants affirmation too. He wants me to be affirming him about how he's running the organization, and I can't. Okay? So getting into relationship with him and demonstrating that kind of finding things that he's doing. Well, working with an organization right now, which is just really having a difficult time. And the CEO, uh, he called me the other day. He, I, I asked him, well, two times he called me this week. And in both cases, I just said, you know, the, the basic, you know, how are you? And the first day, he said, not very good. And the second day, when I made the mistake of asking him again, he said, don't ask that question today. He just feels like he's under siege right now. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of things not, that aren't, just aren't happening the way he wants them to in that organization. And frankly, some of them are his fault. But right now is not the time for me to tell him that. Right now is the time for me to find some things that he's doing that have sustained this company's success over 35 years, build on those, and then earn the right to uh, maybe change some other things. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, one more question. Yes. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, um, random, top-down criticism. Uh, I went into an organization a number of years ago, and again, wonderful organization in a lot of ways, great mission, wonderful people there, but a very uh, inconsistent leader. And uh, you, you could not tell when he was going to come to you and he was going to... Uh, uh, spot bonus you. By, by that I mean, say, hey, you've been working really hard. Here's, you know, here's a thousand bucks. Or just absolutely tear you apart. And I, I believe that, mo I, I said this, <coughs> excuse me, said this before, most human beings do not operate well under conditions of inconsistency. And so people were completely off balance. And furthermore, I felt that the inconsistencies that he had when he would go after people were completely inconsistent with what the mission of the organization was. So we had to call out that behavior. In that case, we were able to fire, uh, we call it firewall, firewall him off from the rest of the organization by putting some other people in between him and the rest of the organization while we build a different culture. And then he came back and admired it. Um, but he probably wasn't capable of pulling that off himself. Did I answer your question? Yes. Thank you. It's 12 o'clock. I thank you for being an attentive audience. It was a pleasure to be with you.